In terms of the Pacific Institute, uh, we are a 501c3 under uh, IRS tax code. So we're a, a, a public interest organization that we started in 1987. A number of researchers uh, at University of California uh, spun off on the belief that uh, research around environmental mission matters was not uh, sufficiently integrated and you needed to take an integrated approach to addressing environmental challenges, something that today we take for granted, but uh, three and a half decades ago uh, was not commonplace. Uh, we are nonpartisan uh, and independent in our research. Our only bias is that we are trying to find solutions uh, to sustainability challenges around water uh, and uh, climate. Our mission is to create and advance solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. And last year, for the first time ever, we set a long-term goal for the organization. It's a 2030 goal, and that is to catalyze the transformation to water resilience in the face of climate change. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, climate change and its implications for water in the US today. The full report that we'll be speaking to is downloadable on our website, um, and we'll even have a specific URL at the end uh, of the presentation where you can find it directly. A few words about my colleagues. Um, Peter Glick, uh, co-founder of the Pacific Institute, uh, now President Emeritus uh, and lead author on this paper, will kick us off with a few slides. Uh, and then Heather Cooley, uh, we'll join the discussion. Heather is uh, the Director of Research at the Pacific Institute, has been with the Institute for well over a decade, and we'll try to have a discussion among the three of us to get as much through these uh, 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 challenges and corollary recommendations as possible. So with that, uh, let me hand to you, Peter. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Jason. I appreciate the introduction. and. Uh, Hello to everybody listening. Again, good afternoon here in California. Good, I guess it's later afternoon on the East and good morning to anyone who might be in a morning time zone. It's obviously a challenge for all of us with these days with these, these uh, electronic meetings and webinars. Um, as Jason said, uh, I'm gonna start with a little bit of an overview of the critical issues that we have addressed, addressed here with water. Um, as I'm sure many people listening know, water is a huge topic. It affects everything we care about. Uh, there are many different kinds of challenges associated with water in the United States and internationally. And again, as Jason mentioned, the Pacific Institute tackles many of those and we have for many years. Um, the purpose today though, was to try and focus down on a set of challenges for the United States uh, that are relevant for the incoming administration. Again, as Jason mentioned, we wrote this report before the election. This is a nonpartisan report. These kinds of issues are relevant for, for the United States as a whole. Um, and we've categorized the major water challenges in four areas. The first is that even today, even in the United States, a, a rich, well-developed country, tens of millions of Americans lack access to safe, affordable drinking water and sanitation. Uh, the pandemic has revealed some of that. Uh, it's raised awareness about the failure in the United States to meet basic needs for water and sanitation for so many. Obviously, this is a huge problem internationally, but it's a problem in the United States as well, especially in uh, poor disadvantaged communities, communities of color, uh, the Native American communities uh, uh, have severe problems with lack of access to safe water and sanitation. So that's a key unresolved issue. The second one is that we know that climate changes are already happening. Uh, human caused climate changes. Uh, we know that climate changes will especially affect water resources uh, and that the consequences of the impacts of climate change on water resources in the United States are going to worsen in the coming years as these climate changes accelerate. And they're related to changes in water availability, changes in water quality, changes in extreme events like floods and droughts. Uh, there are a lot of pieces to the climate change and water problem. Uh, the third category is related to really the connection between water and politics. We know that water resources pose problems and threats to US national and international security. One of the things we've done at the Institute for many, many years is we've maintained something called the water conflict chronology. It's the best open source 
database of conflicts over water internationally. There are a thousand entries going back literally 4,500 years. But water scarcity, water as a weapon, water as a target, water as a trigger of conflict is a growing problem worldwide. And it's a problem for US national and international security interests. And there are serious things that the federal government ought to be and could be doing to address that challenge. The fourth category, the fourth major focus is that the US has no national water strategy. Uh, the failure to develop a comprehensive, coherent, consistent strategy around national water issues threatens the reliability and quality of water supply, wastewater services, and we argue ultimately the public uh, it threatens public health, our ecosystems, and our economy. So around these four buckets, if you will, of challenges, we developed four buckets of, uh, of recommendations. The first is to improve, and, and we'll explore these in more detail in the Q&A in, uh, in the coming minutes, but the four broad categories are improve federal water programs to protect public health, especially in low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, we have some federal water programs that do this. They've not been particularly effective, but there are a series of recommendations we're going to make that we make in the full report focused on public health. The second category is that at the national level, there are things that we ought to be doing to accelerate uh, addressing the risks of climate change for water resources. Um, I should have said this at the beginning, of course, and I'm sure many people listening understand it. Water is often a local issue. It's often a state issue in the United States. Um, but there are critical things that the federal government can do. Uh, and that has been the focus of our recommendations, especially, for example, on this climate change, uh, in this climate change area. The third is to assess and prepare for, for water-related national security threats. And the fourth category, is create a new national water plan. We have had no national water commission thinking about uh, integrated federal efforts since 1973. It's long overdue that in this case, the incoming uh, administration develop a strategy at the national level for addressing water issues. So we'll come back to these in the Q and A. Uh, I just wanted to also simply share some thoughts about what the Institute hopes to do in the coming months and longer uh, in this area. We're prioritizing research on water and equity, on water and climate risks, and on water success stories. And this is an important point. We believe that there are a lot of successful things going on out there in the water world. There are a lot of success stories that point in the direction of a transition to more sustainable water management and use. And the more we understand what's working, the more positive we can be about building those successes to scale. The second category is we're conducting outreach and communications to the public and media on water challenges and solutions. This webinar is just one example of our effort to reach out with some of our thinking about what we know and think about water research and what we know and think about moving forward toward solutions. The third category is we'll be providing briefings for legislators and policymakers about what critical issues uh, face the United States and on what the Congress can do to move forward to address these challenges. And the fourth category is to expand partnerships with researchers, advocacy and community groups and policymakers. Again, as Jason said, we're a research and policy group, um, but we have strong partnerships and we encourage partnerships with the very broad community of people working on water issues. And that's other researchers, it's advocacy groups, it's community groups, and it's policymakers. There are a lot of people working on water issues uh, and no one can do everything all together. And so these kinds of partnerships are a way to build strength in the water community. So with that, I'm gonna stop my presentation. Uh, we're gonna move toward Q&A. Jason's gonna start a facilitated conversation uh, uh, among the panelists. And then we're also hoping that those of you who have questions will submit questions on, am I right, the Q&A? There's a Q&A uh, list. Uh, send them and we will filter through them and try and address them in the time that, that remains uh, here. 
So thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, thanks for the, laying out the landscape so clearly. Heather, let me bring you into the conversation immediately. You're on mute, but let me just start very high level and ask with all the things going on in the world right now, why should the Biden administration even care about water? Yeah, th thanks, Jason. Um, first, there's there's a massive need. Uh, we know that water challenges in the U.S. are severe uh, and they're worsening. Infrastructure is deteriorating in cities and in rural areas. Uh, water quality is at risk and envir the environment as well. Um, we're not meeting basic water and sanitation needs. So there's a real and compelling need um, and the failure to act on this is only going to make it more expensive um, in the future and it's going to create new challenges and new complexities. Um, another, I think, thing to, to point out as well is that, you know, the Biden-Harris team has already announced sort of four priorities, uh, COVID-19, uh, economic recovery, racial equity, and climate change. And water is integral to all of those things. Um, we have seen, you know, as an example with COVID-19, um, one of the major ways of stopping the spread of the virus is through hand washing. Um, yet, far too many people, tens of millions of Americans don't have access to safe, affordable water. Um, and studies are, show that it's communities of color who are facing the brunt of that, who are facing the overwhelming burden. So water is, is intricately connected to the policies that they've already laid forward. Um, but the final reason though, I think is, is perhaps more pragmatic in that, you know, water, um, polls among the most important environmental issue, uh, water quality especially, uh, that you don't see the partisan divide in water as you do in, in things like climate change. Um, and if we're, and as we're looking, we, you know, it's still uncertain which way the Senate's gonna go. Um, but, you know, here's an opportunity uh, with both either Republican or Democrat, um, Democrats to be working on water together. Um, it's also an opportunity, I think, to be bringing us and uniting us. I mean, there's so many divisive issues, um, but here's one where we agree it's a very high priority. So let's use that uh, and, and try to address it and resolve these issues, or at least start to resolve these issues. Fantastic. Um, Peter, over to you. But I, this next question, I'd like Heather for you to weigh in as well, if you're, if you're willing. So there's been quite a bit of discussion under this build back better mantra of infrastructure uh, uh, spend. Some of that's been linked to COVID recovery. Some of it's just more generally other mechanisms around uh, investment in infrastructure in the U.S. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, what, what is the f federal role historically in this when it comes to water and, and specifically what you think in the next four years that could look like or should look like from a federal government perspective? Yeah, thank you. So uh, just as Heather pointed out that for the public, um, water has always been a, a top priority. The public, as as Heather said, always polls well when asked about how they think about water. And similarly, they, they poll pretty well about infrastructure. And there's less of a Democratic-Republican divide about the need to invest in infrastructure. The trick, of course, is what, what do we mean by infrastructure? And historically in the United States, there was a long, in the 20th century, there was a big federal role in funding big physical infrastructure, big dams, big aqueduct systems, big uh, centralized treatment systems. The federal government paid for a lot of that in the 20th century. And that started to fall out of favor, you know, with Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan, they pulled back on federal funding for some of those big projects. Um, unfortunately, at the same time that many states were losing funding for infrastructure projects. And so we're now in a situation where a lot of the US water infrastructure, which used to be world-class, isn't any longer. Uh, we have a water system that provides high quality, really low cost tap water to, to most of the country, but not everyone. And a lot of that infrastructure needs more investment. It needs upgrading, it needs expansion, uh, it needs renewal. So I think the infrastructure question, if there is positive movement on infrastructure, uh, needs a water component at the federal level, but it needs to be a little bit of a rethink of the kinds of infrastructure. Uh, we need to invest in our cities. We need to help water agencies find funding for capital projects that they perhaps can't afford. And we have a state revolving loan fund as an example that has funded some of that. But another way to think about infrastructure is that, you know, high efficiency appliances and toilets uh, that cut the demand for water, 
that should be thought of as infrastructure too. And we ought to figure out a way to encourage improvements in efficiency rather than just building new supply options, which again was the 20th century idea uh, as a way to think about infrastructure. So there are lots of options that I think we could move forward on if we're willing. Terrific. Uh, Heather, anything you would add to that? Yeah, just just to build on that, and and you know, Peter, you'd mentioned um, water efficiency, and 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 some sort of put that in this distributed systems, um, and and there are lots of different types of distributed systems. I mean, historically, as we 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 tended to invest in centralized systems, and I think centralized systems are are still important. They'll be important going forward, um, but we need to think about alternatives or think about ways of complementing that with these distributed systems. Things like efficiency or uh, on-site reuse or district scale reuse, um, perhaps some of these scalping plants. There's lots of different alternatives around reuse or around stormwater capture um, that we can be thinking about. Or even you know, the issue of lead service lines, um, thinking of that as, as infrastructure. There have been a number of groups that have been um, uh, working on that issue. Um, the, the other piece to think about infrastructure is about green infrastructure or, or nature-based solutions. Um, you know, it, it, it's thinking about the, the upland watershed uh, and the upper watershed and how to manage that um, to address these issues. You, you can think about it too, you know, there's a lot of discussion around climate change and the fact that we're going to see less snow melt. Um, it will we'll still get those, those precipitation, those intense precipitation events, but you know, if we're thinking about ways of restoring our upper watersheds, um, creating healthier forests that can then capture and hold on to that water and slowly release it. Um, you know, those are the types of things we need to be thinking about in, in the 21st century, um, rather than sort of the old, kind of the old, old technologies and old approaches. Yeah, J Jason, a couple more, more thoughts here. Um, one is that, uh, again, this came up a little bit earlier, but uh, the communities that don't have access to safe water in, in the U.S., for example, on, on Native American lands, as much as 40% of households don't have access to piped water, which is unbelievable in the 21st century, that we have failed to meet basic needs for water infrastructure for these communities. And that's infrastructure. That's an investment that, that mm -hmm. needs to be made. Um, another point that, that Heather raised is a dollar invested in reducing the demand for water through water efficiency actually is much more effective than a dollar invested today in finding new supply. Um, and that's the, the traditional supply versus the conservation and efficiency kind of investments that, that we could be pursuing. Um, okay. Great. Hang on a sec. <laughs> well, what, let, while you're, while you're uh, muting that mic, that, that, that actually is a good segue, uh, maybe back over to Heather a little bit. Uh, and, and you know, building on the vulnerable communities that lack access, one of the things this paper does is debunk the myth that we've got it sorted out in this country that uh, everyone has access. What, what, what are some of the barriers here that, uh, that have, have resulted in this current circumstance and what can the Biden administration do to resolve and overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, you know, you're right. Most, most people assume everyone in, in the US has access to safe, affordable drinking water. And, and most people do, um, but there have been studies, there was a, a recent study uh, by US Water Alliance and Dig Deep that identified 2 million uh, residents that, that don't have plumbing don't, or don't have running water. Um, and that, that, that's really just the tip of the, tip of the iceberg. Uh, we also have tens of millions of people who are drinking unsafe water um, and an untold number who, who can't afford basic water and sanitation. So it, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's one, frankly, we don't really understand the full scale or scope of it. Um, and that's been one barrier. Uh, we don't have very good data or information. We're not collecting the right information to understand uh, the issue. Um, another barrier, though, has been, frankly, poor enforcement of laws and regulations, poverty, um, a legacy of racism. I mean, it, there are many hurdles, um, but there are things I think we can do and this administration can do. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about infrastructure investments. Um, and, and we should be prioritizing those in low income communities and communities of color. Um, those communities that need it the most um, should be getting that information. Communities who can, who can pay for it um, should. Um, another is, is really providing financial support and, and even technical support for uh, regionalization or consolidation. We have a huge number of uh, systems, small systems in particular that struggle the most um, to provide safe drinking water and affordable drinking water. And so 
um, where we can support consolidation or regionalization um, can help to get at that. Um, another issue, and this has come up quite a bit uh, in, in the past nine or 10 months, um, is the issue of shutoffs. Um, and, and, and some areas uh, have, in some states, have established moratoriums on shutoffs or are, are just not conducting them. Um, and, and yet there are bills that are still piling up. Um, utilities are still having to pay to provide that water. Um, and so there needs to be emergency funding um, to help those utilities continue to provide service, um, but also to help those families who can't afford it. Um, and, and we need to then look to, to more long-term funding. Um, we don't have federal programs around water uh, in the US. We do have energy affordability programs. We don't have water affordability programs. And so that would be uh, another area. Um, and then, and finally is around um, workforce development and job training, particularly for, for women and uh, people of color. Um, you know, folks who have been sort of left out, left behind, or there's an, an opportunity as we're making infrastructure investments, there are jobs associated with those and we could be training people to bring them back into the workforce to do those. Excellent. Shifting gears a bit and turning back to you, Peter. Um, there's this long standing uh, metaphor that if climate change uh, were a shark, then water would be the teeth. Uh, that's where the bite comes out. Can you talk a little bit about what the water-related threats are of climate change to communities and our economy here in the U.S.? Just unpack that for a little bit. What does that look like? Yeah, that's one, that's one of my favorite metaphors, too. Uh, climate change is all about water. It's about the hydrologic cycle, which is a fundamental part of the climate cycle. And we know that humans are changing the climate, uh, nobody rational who pays attention to science denies that. Um, and some of the worst impacts of climate change will be on our water resources. Uh, we're already seeing rising temperatures. That increases the evaporation of water, the loss of water from soils, the demand for water from our crops and our agricultural system. Um, we're seeing rising sea levels, which is contaminating coastal aquifers and uh, upsetting the balance between salt and freshwater ecosystems on the, along the coast, not to mention, of course, the vulnerability of the coast anyway. Uh, we're seeing changes in precipitation patterns and storm frequency and intensity. Hurricanes are more intense and they carry more water. They're causing more flooding. Uh, that's also a fingerprint, if you will, of climate change on, on our water resources and on humans. And it's gonna get worse. Um, we, we just know that that's the reality. There are two critical things we ought to be doing. Uh, well, there are a series of critical things we, we ought to be doing. Um, the first is, and, and there's been discussion about this already, we need to rejoin the Paris Agreement, the international agreement uh, to address emissions of greenhouse gases. The Biden administration has already said that when they, they, uh, there's a transition that they will rejoin the Paris Agreement, which Trump withdrew the US from. Uh, and that's very important, and it'll hopefully lead to changes in the way we emit greenhouse gases, which can reduce the severity of the problem in the, in the long run. We need to support the U.S. National Climate Assessment. The, there's something called the National Climate Assessment. It's required by law since 1990. Um, it's been done four or five times now. The next one is underway. Uh, but we need, it's the assessment that helps us understand what the impacts of climate change will be in the United States, including on water resources. Um, all federal agencies ought to be integrating climate risk into their policies and their plans, including the EPA and the Department of the Interior and those responsible for our water resources, the Department of Agriculture as well. They need to be thinking about what climate change is going to mean in the long run. Um, it would be nice if we figured out a way to revise the uh, national flood insurance program so that communities that are likely to be at increasing flood risk from climate change um, get the protection they need, and that we don't rebuild in vulnerable flood zones. And, and that, re, you know, revising the National Flood Insurance Plan has been, has been called for for a long time, but we've taken no action on it. Um, finally, we need to understand that there's a very strong connection between the way we produce and use water and the way we produce greenhouse gases. Um, again, I'm sure many people on this, on this call already understand the connections between water and energy. But those connections are very strong. It takes a lot of energy to collect and produce and treat and distribute our water resources. And that means greenhouse gas emissions. Anything we can do to break that link between our water system and our emissions of greenhouse gases 
can help reduce the severity of climate change in the future. So adapt to the impacts that are unavoidable now and mitigate to the extent we can those changes that are still to come. Great. Um, normally, this would be the time when I would encourage people to submit their questions. Um, given that we have 31 questions already, I, and many of which are very good, I've been reading them as they're coming in. Um, I will uh, say now that one of the things that we debated in the lead up was whether or not if we did get lots of questions, whether we might be able to follow up um, with some of them in some sort of written format, maybe in a blog. And given the caliber of many of these questions, I think that's looking more and more likely that we'll try to respond to as many as, the, as we can in some sort of uh, post webinar uh, synthesis and, and write up. But let me turn to you, Heather. Um, technologists, we live in uh, the innovation hub of America in the, with Silicon Valley next door. Uh, we'll say that there's an opportunity to solve most of our sustainability challenges with technology uh, and data and information, particularly as it relates to water. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you see as the promise uh, of this, uh, of technology and better data and information for water going forward and how the Biden administration might think about these issues. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I mean, you know, as you know, there is a, a opportunity for um, data, information, technology to, to really help us better manage water and to make us more resilient. Um, but I think we also need to realize and, and acknowledge that technology alone is not going to solve our problem. We have to couple that um, with uh, with smart policies, with uh, smart financing approaches. I mean, there, there's lots of things involved. But that being said, <laughs> um, there are opportunities for for technology. Absolutely, um, there are a lot a range of, of technologies available. I mean. Frankly, at one level, you can think of dams and reservoirs as sort of the old technology. And as we're thinking about reuse and efficiency and stormwater capture and, and some of the forms of desalination um, as being sort of the new technologies that we should be in, investing in, moving away from some of those traditional supply. Um, but in addition, you know, there's lots of, of, of sensors that are now available that can allow for automation of water systems. Um, that's something particularly, again, with COVID, uh, with a lot, with a re more remote workforce, um, you know, those utilities that were able and have already invested in those were much better able to manage the system. Um, there are advanced meters, for example, that are providing sort of real-time information around demand. They're helping to identify leaks. Um, and, and as our, our systems get older and our, our homes and equipment get older, more of those will, will come to the fore. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for new technologies um, and, and even frankly, some older technologies to actually be implemented um, to help solve some of our problems. Um, and, and there is a lot that the federal government can do. And, uh, you know, if we think about the funding that's available, whether it's through uh, the, the, the state revolving funds or through WIFIA, you know, ensuring that there are new technologies um, that, that qualify for that. Um, there are also, though, you know, opportunities for, for programs that the federal government could run to test new technologies um, and to do piloting and to help particularly those small and medium sized utilities that don't really have the resources to do some of that. Um, you do see the large utilities able to make those types of uh, investments in new technologies. It's much harder for the small and medium size. So having uh, someone who is evaluating those, um, providing that information can be quite helpful. Um, and then finally, you know, one other area to think about is, is the, and, and Peter talked about, you know, the water efficiency opportunities. And, and we have a water sense program and an energy star program, uh, both of which focus on the efficiency of new appliances and fixtures. Um, and there's lots of opportunities there. We've seen improvements in those technologies over time, and there are still opportunities to, to drive those even further, um, particularly thinking about commercial devices. Um, so, so lots of things that, that we can do at the federal level to, to try to advance technology and improve our data and information. Terrific. Let's shift gears a bit. Federal role in, in foreign policy. Um, the, the recommendations paper talks about uh, increasing water-related conflict and risk for uh, national security. Uh, I think the Department of Defense has talked about water as being a risk multiplier or a threat multiplier. Um, Peter, can you talk a little bit about what, what this what this emerging or growing uh, conflict around water resources, what, what, what that looks like and how that relates back to risk for the United States and what role we might have in mitigating some of this risk uh, uh, related to water and conflict? 
Yeah, so um, again, water is often a local issue. It's often a, you know, a city issue. It's a municipal issue. But if there's any issue that really involves the full role of the federal government, it's these international questions about water and conflict and the risk that, that uh, disputes over water resources will lead to failed, failed states and will involve the military. And as you just mentioned, Jason, the U.S. military has been really good about thinking about this. One of the things they do as their core job is to try and understand risks and threats. And for many years, uh, and again, a lot of this is on our website, they have put out assessments saying we understand that water scarcity, tensions over, over shared water resources that cross international borders can produce threats uh, that ultimately will affect the United States. And so understanding what those threats are is a, is a critical issue. Uh, the U.S. intelligence agencies and the military ought to expand efforts to identify and analyze water-related threats. Uh, we at the, at the Institute, we think about this in three ways. Uh, water is a trigger of conflict where scarcity or control of water resources is disputed. Uh, the sort of I want your water kinds of, of examples. The second is where water or water systems are targets or casualties of conflicts that start for other reasons. Um, uh, conflicts over religious or ethnic or ideological or border or economic issues, but where water systems are then targeted. Uh, and we saw examples of this, for example, in, in Yemen in recent years. And the third category is where water or water systems are used as a weapon of conflict, where uh, somebody takes control of a dam and uses it to flood a downstream community or withholds water from a downstream community. And again, we've seen recent examples of this, and they're all described in the water conflict chronology I mentioned. But understanding those and then putting in place strategies to reduce those risks is the answer. Uh, technology to, to permit access to water where it wasn't available previously, or diplomatic efforts to negotiate settlements between two countries that share water resources uh, on the many, many rivers that are shared by more than two or more nations. Um, internally in the United States, we ought to be looking at helping local water agencies understand local threats to water systems. We've seen cybersecurity threats to some of these remote systems that Heather mentioned. Increasingly, they're operated remotely by computer, and there have been some cyber threats to some of the U.S. water systems. Understanding and protecting U.S. water systems from these kinds of threats is another piece of this aspect of reducing conflicts over water resources. Um, uh, and I would note that uh, the Pacific Institute and the World Resources Institute and the Water Peace and Security Partnership put out a paper a few months ago or a month or so ago uh, summarizing some of these strategies. And, and we can share the URL at some point with, with people who are interested uh, about strategies to reduce water-related conflicts worldwide. Great. Okay. So we have now uh, a little over 20 minutes of working time. I'm going to start trying to wade through these. I'll do my best to clump them where they seem to be asking the same thing. Uh, apologies in advance if I don't do that well. Um, right out of the gates, one of the questions was, are, have we actually reached out to the, uh, the, the, the transition team, Biden-Harris, on, uh, on this issue of water as it relates either to the COVID task force or otherwise? Yes is the simple answer. We have begun those conversations. Um, there's uh, a okay, whole bunch I, of questions. I would just that... note a quick comment about that. Before the election, we reached out to both campaigns with these recommendations. Uh, again, as Jason mentioned earlier, we're a nonpartisan organization. We sent these recommendations uh, to everyone involved in all of the campaigns. Yep. Great. So there are a suite of questions about this national planning process, and I'm going to try to pull them together. You might want to get your pens out because um, there, it's going to be long. Um, th th there's one question that's really about like, who's developing this national plan. Uh, is it EPA or is it multi-agency? Who's involved in that? Um, related around that process is recognizing we are a deeply divided country, red and blue. Can you actually come up with a national strategy in the current political climate um, that we face here. Um, and then, um, you know, what is the collaboration uh, around not only the development of this plan, but the implementation? So it's kind of some thoughts on who's developing it, are we going to be able to pull it off politically? Uh, and then, you know, how do we, once we've created such a plan, do we transition toward implementation? 
Yeah, can I um can I yeah. address that first to begin with? Please. Um, so I, I said at the beginning that we haven't had a national water plan since 1973. At that time, the federal government created a committee, a commission to look at water issues in the United States. And at the time, you know, at the, it was mostly water quality, water pollution issues the, in the early 70s when we got the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, so there is precedent for pulling together a bipartisan scientists, community groups, um, uh, uh, legislators, a commission to try and review what the critical issues are today, and they're different than they were in the 70s, uh, and produce a set of recommendations. I would also note that there is a long-standing subcommittee called the Subcommittee on Water Availability and Quality that's organized out of the um, OSTP, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, uh, and that subcommittee includes all of the major secretaries of the major departments, the Department of Commerce, Agriculture, NOAA, uh, the EPA, uh, the Department of Defense. It, it's a very broad, high-level subcommittee to try and address issues around water quality and availability. Um, the subcommittee has not been active over the last four years. One, one report on desalination was produced uh, a year ago, uh, but it has not been very active. But the, the structure exists for this kind of assessment to develop a national water plan uh, to, to happen. And I would hope that the new administration would use the existing systems that they have, and the National Academy of Sciences can play a role here. Are uh, there mechanisms to move forward on developing such a plan? Um, any thoughts, Peter, before I turn to Heather on uh, the political climate and uh, finding consensus uh, on the scope uh, and ambition of such plans? Yeah, I don't have much intelligent to say about that because I don't know how the politics are going to work out. I don't know what the makeup of the Senate is going to be. We don't know yet. Um, but Heather's point early that water really is a bipartisan issue gives me a sense of optimism that that policies and strategies can be put forward to invest in infrastructure, to develop strategies to meet the needs of disadvantaged communities, to invent, to make some of the the changes that we, we think are necessary. Um, but but honestly, we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah. Heather, what would you add here? You're muted. You're, mute, you're muted. Yeah, just on that last point, and I, I, I would agree, it's, it's it, we'll see how things play out. Um, but, you know, I think even when there are divisions, there are opportunities to bring people together to find areas of agreement. I mean, we, we held some uh, discussions, a series of discussions a number of years ago around where we agree. Um, and even though there were groups that typically disagree on a lot, a lot of issues around water, there were opportunities and things that they were in agreement on. Um, and so, you know, I do think uh, water potentially could be an issue. You know, we've talked about water conflict, but water is being an issue potentially that brings us together. We don't see that partisan divide quite so much on this issue as we do in other areas. So hopefully this, this could be a bright spot. Yeah, so I'm gonna stay with the plan, the national plan, and it, it talks about scope and geographic reach. Um, scope being that there's a sense that, you know, the feds have been um, more inclined to uh, engage national water quality issues, less so when it, uh, more of a re reluctance when it comes to the water quantity and water resource management side. And then also this issue of how much a national plan drives down into the issues that are playing out at a basin scale or even lower, um, kind of where you see some of the boundaries there. So scope in terms of, you know, trying to speak to how this, uh, issue deals with the water quantity uh, side of the equation and also kind of how it relates to on the ground or basin scale. Any, any thoughts for those are great questions. They're hard ones, but any thoughts on that? I, I can jump in and then Peter, if yeah. you want to sort of add to it. Um, in terms of the scope, I mean, I, I think it has to be a broad scope. I mean, I, you know, as I, as I laid out and as the, the paper lays out, our water challenges are diverse um, and many, <laughs> too many. Uh, you know, it's around infrastructure, it's quantity, it's quality, um, uh, it's, it's around rate structures and the financial, you know, sus sustainability of them. Um, so I do think the scope has to be broad to tackle these issues. Um, and, you know, I, I think there is, as Peter sort of laid out, um, issues, particularly quantity, are, are often uh, dealt with locally. But 
but the federal government does operate massive uh, water uh, water quantity and water supply infrastructure. And so there, there's an obvious role um, there as well. Um, in terms of the geography, I mean, you're right. I think the, the relative importance of these issues may be vary uh, in different parts of the state, even within, or deep, different parts of the country, even within a particular state, you see that. Um, but you know, I do think it's possible again if we if we set a fairly broad uh, scope and, and and address these things on on more of a regional basis, we can make some progress. Great. Um, I, I'll just add to this that you know, in terms of the partisan divide, I, I, I guess the degree to which you start thinking about climate change and its implications on water availability and storm events uh, and how that plays out in rural areas agricultural regions in our in our country and the mitigation strategies uh, that seems to be a series of issues that would uh, bridge uh, across political divides uh, and uh, and have some promise especially if there's investment in some of these mitigation strategies so um, there's been a, a number of questions that have uh, noted uh, the absence of reference in our work uh, on this paper to the human right to water. Uh, and how does this fit in uh, in terms of uh, the federal um, uh, uh, role and or uh, the national plan? Uh, can you somebody speak to the human right to water and how that uh, informs uh, some of the social equity work that we are talking about here? Yeah, I'm happy to tackle that. As, as as some of you may know, the Institute and I have done a lot of work on the human right to water over years. Over the years, uh, there is a formal human right to water declared by the UN in 2010. Uh, the state of California and a couple of other states have now adopted at the legislative level, at the state level, a declaration that there is a human right to water. Uh, the the trick, of course, is what does that mean? Um, we've still, as we said at the beginning, there are 10 million, you know, there are millions of Americans that don't have access to safe water and sanitation, uh, which is fundamental to the human right to water and sanitation, by the way, which is included. Um, so I, I think about the human right to water only really in the context of the priority that we set at meeting unmet needs for, for affordable, safe water and sanitation. Uh, it's a goal at the international level, the sustainable development goals, uh, have called out, especially SDG 6, the need to meet by 2030, 100% of the global needs for safe water and sanitation. Obviously, that ought to be a goal in the U.S. as well. And there's no reason we can't meet that. It's not a technological problem. I would argue it's not an economic problem. It's a commitment of will and resources problem uh, in the United States and elsewhere. So yes, there's a human right to water. I would love to see it a little more explicitly applied to this need to meet basic human needs for for water service, water and water services, um, but uh, it's I guess it's a question of framing. Heather, anything you would like to add to that? Muted. Um, just just sort of quickly on that, just to 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 lay uh, to add, you know, if you look at some of the recommendations we put forth and on some of the issues, they are trying to uh, achieve that human right to water, whether or not it's adopted as policy at the federal level um, or even within individual states. I think we still, as Peter noted, uh, we we can uh, achieve it. Um, it's it's about will and it's about dedicating resources to do it. Um, there was a question around the SDG and wondering whether uh, the SDGs and goal six in particular on water is uh, how the Biden administration might think about its national plan and strategy in, as it relates to SDG six. Any, any thoughts there? Yeah, uh, just quickly. Th there was not a lot of interest in the previous administration, the current administration, not soon to be previous administration in dealing with the United Nations. Um, as you know, we withdrew from the World Health Organization. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of participation by the U.S. at the U.N. Uh, and the SDGs are a global effort. I, I, I'm hoping I haven't heard much from the Biden administration, if anything, about the SDGs. But, but it seems plausible that we will begin to pay more attention to the critical role that the U.S. can play in meeting the sustainable development goals, not just for water, which is SDG 6, but for all of them that have to do with poverty and energy and health and education and and so on. Um, again, water is critical to, to all of those things. Uh, we could play a bigger role with our commitment of resources to meet the SDG targets around the world. Uh, 
Uh, that's something the State Department could be more involved in. It's something USAID could be more involved in. Um, I, I'm hoping that we'll move in that direction. Great. Um, uh, I've got a, a question uh, I can let you guys start to think about already while I, I, I do a, an aside, which is, you know, what's the role of the Biden administration on, when it comes to agriculture and particularly um, uh, both the climate resilience side of the equation, but also managing water quality? Presumably that's about return flow and nutrients, I'm guessing, or pesticides. But I'd like your thoughts on that. We did get a question of how come we weren't able to see all the questions. People would have benefited from seeing the questions. I'll just say, unfortunately, everyone's muted and uh, and the questions are hidden just for fear of being Zoom bombed and having very disruptive questions for those. It's an open platform and uh, we just weren't able to manage it otherwise. So um, do know that we will uh, look to answer as many of these questions as possible uh, in written form after the event itself, but that was the logic. Um, so who wants to uh, talk about the um, what the Biden uh, administration should do when it comes to water and agriculture and particularly around water quality. Heather? Jump in quick, quickly. Um, and then Peter, if you wanna to add on, I mean, you know, we talked a bit about sort of infrastructure and, and certainly um, agriculture is, is uses infrastructure and there's a lot of investment needs there too to modernize those. Um, whether it be sort of lining canals, whether it be using pipelines instead of canals. There's lots of opportunities. And, and two, much as we were talking about um, urban efficiency, there are agricultural efficiency opportunities, uh, transitioning to drip irrigation, um, some of the more uh, irrigation controllers and sensors that are available, I think can go a long way to help reducing, um, reducing some of the demand for agriculture, which you know accounts for 70 to 80%, depending on where you are, uh, of water usage. So lots of opportunities, um, I think, that there. Anything yeah, I would, yeah, I would just add that um, on the water quality side, again, Jason, as your, your introductory comment here just, just noted, um, some of the big water quality issues in the United States that are still not really addressed uh, have to do with agricultural chemicals. And efforts to help the agricultural community uh, reduce the use of pesticides and fertilizers in particular uh, that are contributing to a lot of the water quality problems, especially in the Midwest, uh, would be a, a big step forward. Uh, it's something that has to be done in conjunction with the agricultural community. Uh, the United States is an incredibly powerful agricultural uh, producer, and that needs to continue. Uh, as Heather mentioned, Anything we can do to grow more food with less water is a huge advantage for leaving water in stream for ecosystems, for freeing up water for, for disadvantaged communities, for reducing water quality problems. Um, in addition, the Clean Water Act, and this is, this is related to the agricultural chemicals issue, the Clean Water Act needs to be revised and updated and modernized. Um, the effort to pass the waters of the United States uh, uh, Effort, the, the waters of the United States effort is, a, is something that the agricultural community is concerned about and interested in. It's going to be revived again with the Biden administration and moving it forward in a positive way is something that I, I think we should pursue. Great. I'm glad you made a segue to the environment. There's a number of questions about this, uh, the pointing out that we've focused a lot on water for people and communities, but what about uh, how water for the environment fits into the plan? Um, there's questions about what's the Biden's um, uh, administration's role in ensuring uh, ecosystem function and ecosystem services and biodiversity. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this green, uh, this nature-based solutions uh, and, you know, uh, how we think about investments in natural solutions in a way that maintains environmental health and biodiversity. So, um, Heather, will you get us kicked off here with any thoughts that you have on how the Biden administration might think about uh, the environment and uh, aquatic ecosystems in the next four years? Yeah, and um, I, I do want to point out, uh, and, and sometimes this uh, connection isn't as explicit, but you know, a lot of the strategies we're talking around around efficiency and reuse and stormwater capture, those have environmental benefits as well. Um, we're reducing the amount of water that needs to be taken from rivers and streams and groundwater aquifers. Um, and that therefore leaves water in stream and leaves for, for other purposes. So there is a benefit there. Um, and so, and that's one of the reasons why we're supportive of shifting um, that those investments and those infrastructure investments, to those types of strategies um, that does allow us to help protect and restore those systems. 
Um, the other piece, and I mentioned this briefly, but was, was again, thinking more broadly about infrastructure and thinking about the natural environment as, as part of that. Um, you know, we live in a, there are, in fact, you know, all of these systems, all these natural systems have a human influence on them. Um, and so, and, and we need those systems, um, we manage those systems, uh, and so we can better protect them. Um, that provides benefit for us. It also provides benefit for, for the ecosystem. So some of the upland restoration, um, some of the forest restoration types of projects are really important from, for water, um, but they're important for those systems themselves. Peter, any other thing, or before I move on, I can no, move on just to another. Quickly add that this is an area where science is critically important. You know, we're in the 20th century, we destroyed a lot of our natural aquatic ecosystems because we didn't understand or we didn't care about the implications of human use of water for those systems. But, but we do more understand that today and we do more care about it. And it's an area where science and research really is needed to understand how much water and what qualities of water and the timing of water availability is needed to keep all those ecosystems healthy. And there's a role there for the federal government, for organizations like the USGS and NOAA and the EPA and the Department of Agriculture. Um, uh, that, that's a, a critical need. Uh, and it's, it's one that the federal government has not paid attention to recently. So I'm cognizant of the time. We have about five minutes of working time left. I'm gonna take one more question then I'm gonna ask for, I'm gonna do a sum up question. I'm hoping you both can answer or try to answer. So one of the questions is just noting that once we move from goal setting and strategies about a national plan, and once you transition into implementation, funding becomes a pretty critical aspect of this. Um, and yet a lot of these um, strategies, these local strategies, green infrastructure are, are pretty out of reach for many utilities uh, and local level entities. Um, and there's a question around, and particularly if you're trying to make these investments in a way that is uh, trying to achieve some of the social equity benefits. Uh, and so the question is, uh, you know, is there a, a role of trying to calculate um, what, well, first of all, what the cost of inaction is, uh, what does it cost us if we the do nothing clause, but, um, but what um, the way we might think about um, the multiple benefits and to, to be able to describe uh, and quantify what those benefits are with these investments and perhaps use that as a way to derive more innovative funding arrangements. Let me start with you, Heather, on that to talk about innovations in financing uh, and uh, particularly uh, how the feds might think about this when it comes to local and utilities. Yeah, and it, you know, um, you sort of made the point um, or implied that, that some of these green infrastructure projects are, are more expensive. Um, and, and I wanna push back on that on, on two points. Um, one is that, you know, some of these more traditional solutions, um, these large infrastructure had tremendous amount of externalities associated with them. So while they may look cheaper, at, you know, uh, at first blush, um, they have the detrimental impacts um, on, on ecosystems. Um, they also have been incredibly expensive to maintain. And that was something that was not adequately considered. Um, and one of the reasons why we've seen a failure to continue those investments and we see such a massive need for investment. Um, the other though is, is the point you made about, about additional co-benefits. Um, you know, if we think about green infrastructure, let, you know, let's think about uh, stormwater as one uh, example there. Managing stormwater, depending on the strategy, let's say you take a green infrastructure type of approach, um, there can be a water quantity benefit if you're capturing that water, infiltrating it under, underground. Uh, there can be a water supply benefit associated with that. Um, there can be recreational benefits, there, there are public health benefits, there's lots of different types of benefits that can uh, accrue there. And, and then that pre presents an opportunity to think about co-financing and co-funding, um, bringing in uh, um, stakeholders, bringing in agencies, for example, that fund in these different areas, areas that have, you know, transportation tends to be um, pretty well funded, particularly if we're talking about federal investment, it, it, a lot of it goes to transportation. Um, some of these, some of those funds can be dedicated towards these green infrastructure projects that create benefits, uh, you know, related benefits there. So there are, uh, I think, a, a need for us to be thinking more creatively, um, to be understanding what the connections are and the co-benefits, and that's going to help to then create additional funding sources um, for these. Terrific. Types of 
So we have only a couple of minutes left. Peter, can I ask that you pull up the screen again that has the URL where people can find the report that we are speaking to today? And then the takeout question I want to that both of your thoughts on is uh, kind of a crystal ball uh, question, which is um, what does good look like? Uh, what, under, under a best case scenario, uh, four years from now, what, what has the Biden administration done when it comes to water? Heather, can you get us started on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, these are big problems and, and we can't think that they're going to be solved. Uh, they're long term problems. The solutions are going to be uh, there's no simple fixes, um, but we can make progress. Um, we could certainly make meaningful progress uh, looking at lead service lines. Uh, we won't be able to uh, remove all of those, but having a plan, ambitious goals and then meaningful progress towards those goals. Um, we can uh, establish federal affordability programs. That's something we can do in four years. Um, more data and information, um, you know, on par with what we're collecting, let's say, on round energy. We, we you know, have seen a, a great drop off in, in the meager water data that we had, um, particularly over the last uh, several years. So, you know, they're, they're, I, I think those would be good. I, you know, I'll let Peter kind of add on. Yeah, great. so I think it would be great if there was a national water plan that laid out an agenda for a decade about what we ought to be doing on water, mm -hmm. at least to give some guidelines and guideposts and targets. Um, I would love to see accelerated uh, regulation of some of the chemicals that we have failed to regulate in drinking water under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, get, get, get rid of, you know, change the lead and copper uh, rule, get the PFASs and the perchlorates finally regulated and many other things. And, and frankly, I'm just gonna be happy to see science used to inform policy again um, if we move forward in that area, we can't help but make progress. Fantastic. Uh, great way to end, too. Um, very much back to our raison d'etre at the Pacific Institute. So I um, want to thank you both uh, uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us today. I want to I wanna also thank everyone that took the time out of their busy schedules to join this webinar. I know they're there are many of them uh, and everyone is very busy. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. Uh, we will do our best to follow up and answer as many of these great questions as we can, perhaps in the form of a blog or some other frequently asked questions written right up. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I wanna thank you for being uh, supporters of the Institute. Uh, I welcome those to uh, continue to support the Institute. Uh, there is a donate button on our homepage in case you find the type of work that we do compelling and worthy of support. Uh, but in any case, I hope everyone can stay safe uh, and, um, and uh, hold it together during these uh, crazy times uh, that we are in. So thank you and bye. Thank you.